Hello, my name is Dawn Durham out of the Patent East office. I'm so excited that you're joining me today as we explore two valuable resources for educators. Let me share my screen and we'll start right away. So the two resources I wanna share with you today are the National Center on Improving Literacy and Lead for Literacy. Both sites are built around making sure that evidence-based practices in reading are readily available to teachers like you and I all across the nation. So I wanna highlight just a few things about each of these resources. I do strongly encourage you to get on your computer and kind of explore around these sites because there's so much more to offer than I'll be able to share today. I'm just gonna highlight a couple of key features that I think you will find as valuable as I do. So let's start with the National Center on Improving Literacy. Right away, when you get to this homepage, you're gonna notice that there are three different paths for the audience members, parents and families, schools and districts, and state agencies. All are valuable resources. I wanna highlight the schools and districts for right now, and then I'm gonna highlight a really great re resource for your students when they're in school and when they're at home or with a caregiver. So let's start with school and districts. I'm just gonna come over here and click school and districts. This site, the National Center on Improving Literacy, again, the goal is to get evidence-based practices readily available into the hands of teachers like you and I. It makes everything so accessible. They have such great resources that are very easy to understand, easy to obtain, and easy to share out across with your colleagues, families, community members. So I wanna just highlight a few things here. I'm gonna scroll down and I'm gonna explore by topic. Now you can go ahead and click on all these little briefs and I'll show you a little more about that in a bit, but I wanna just see and show you some of the big topics. Um, and these are really based on what's kind of happening in the field. What are conversations going on about? So you'll notice that some of the more um, hot topics are really right up front here. So I'll just click dyslexia because we know there's a lot of conversation around students who are having um, difficulty with word reading. So here is a wide variety of information around dyslexia for you to have for your own knowledge, for you to share with your colleagues, for you to have conversations with families and caregivers as well. I want to highlight um, two that I think are just really stellar resources. Understanding dyslexia, myths and facts. My gosh, I know you're like me. We hear all kinds of misinformation out there, especially when it comes to dyslexia. So here, the National Center on Improving Literacy has created a quick infographic to really kind of clear up some of those misconceptions around dyslexia. It's palatable, it's bite size it's something that we can all access and share readily. You can download this infographic, again, share it with admins, share it with peers, share it with your families, caregivers, and community members, but just a great resource to really start to dispel some of those myths. Let me show you another one that I just think is a, a great resource. Again, around dyslexia, because I think that's something that's just so talked about lately. You can see there's lots of them here. There's multiple screens worth. Let me go. Here is, I think, you know, when I think about questions that I get asked so many times, in my work at Patent, we hear so often about, well, how can we screen? How can we identify who is at risk for dyslexia? So when I click on this one, now this is not an infographic, this is actually a recording of a session done by a leader in the field around how do we screen for dyslexia and other reading difficulties. So this is something that you could watch, you could watch with a group, you could watch with some colleagues and have some conversations around just to really enhance our knowledge around dyslexia word reading difficulties, how do we identify reading difficulties, and then how do we you know, kind of start to intervene and close that opportunity and achievement gap. So just some really great resources for you. I'm gonna head back here and I'll show you some more. I'm gonna stick with school and districts for just a little bit longer. Let's look at beginning reading. Another big topic as we continue to talk about. Here you're gonna see a lot of toolkits. These are toolkits, lots of materials that have been built for practitioners to really help guide us through what do we need to know and how are we gonna implement this new knowledge in our classrooms? So I'll just click the first one, but you'll notice there's lots of different toolkits available to you. So let's just look at alphabetic principle and phonics. Here is what I have available to me. I can look at definitions. I can get some teaching Welcome resources. to phonics. To begin, Here it's going to click take me start down to here are some things, some resources and tips that you could do in the classroom today to help you with the alphabetic principle and phonics. Right? 
if there's some videos here, right? There's lots of different resources. So if I was maybe unsure about some things, I can head to the definition section and get a little bit more clarity on what it is exactly this toolkit's gonna be talking about. Again, I'll highlight lots of toolkits, phonics, fluency, intensification. How do we bump up? How do we ramp up instruction for students who seem to be struggling a bit in the classroom? Phonological and phonemic awareness. There's just the list goes on and on and on. And there are actually several screens or several pages worth of these toolkits. So definitely something to take a look at. All right, I want to take you to probably my favorite part on the National Center on Improving Literacy, and that's called Kid Zone. Now, I'm going to share this with you with the intent of this is a site that you could have your students on while they're in the classroom or certainly valuable to introduce this to families and caregivers, community members, uh, child care providers, so that when students have some availability on screen time, which we know they often do, we can be putting them on this site, which is such a more valuable site than perhaps some of the other activities the kids are engaging in. So let me show you KidZone. Now, KidZone is set up in three different ways. You could read, listen, and play, and they do just what they say they're going to do. So let's click on the read button. Here you'll notice right on top, we can choose an age, choose if we want a comic book or an ebook, and kind of choose our genre. Here's what I'll tell you, and I tell students all the time. Leave it on all ages and all subjects. There's such a wide variety of books here that students are able to read and engage with. By all means, leave it up there so that they can see what is available to them. However, if you have a specific student you're thinking of and you say, well, you know what, this little friend is a little bit younger. I want them to be thinking about books that are more appropriate for their age. By all means, click an age category. That's perfectly fine. Okay. Let me show you what this feature does in KidZone. So I'm going to go to one of some of my favorite books here. This is called the Uncanny Chronicle series. Now, these books were written for KidZone. We're not going to find them anywhere else. They are exclusive to KidZone, which makes it that much more exciting for our students. And if I click read here, my students are going to be able to explore this book online as if they had a book in front of them. They're going to read page by page, just like if they had the book in front of them. And you can see it's kind of like comic book like or graphic novel like. They can go through and listen to the whole or read the whole story, right? How exciting that they have access to quality books right on here on the screen, which we know they're engaging with the screen anyway. Let me show you a couple other features with these books as well. I could, if I have a student who perhaps is a little more reluctant to read or perhaps is unable to access this print by themselves, so not really, doesn't really have the skill set to read on their own independently, I could have them watch it on YouTube where someone reads the text to them, right? So they can follow along. So another way in which we make the reading accessible for our students. All right, that was the read portion. Let me show you listen. Listen is going to be just that. Students are gonna be able to listen to the different stories being read. Now you have a wider range of ages here, right? Same kind of genre setup, but let me show you what this looks like here. So I'm just gonna choose a blanket of snow because I think it's a sweet little book. Okay. Take a look up here. Think about your multilingual learners. You can have different narrations in the different languages. So this would be a way in which your students who are non-native English speakers can be accessing stories during a time when perhaps that wasn't available before. So you can choose the language in which you'd like the book to be read. I think that's such an important feature to point out. Okay. Okay, so here I'm just going to click the button and it's going to read to me each time. A Blanket of Snow by Zyga Kress. My friends will just click the button to turn the page. A Blanket of Snow by Zyga Kress. Sometimes in winter. And we can go through page by page by page, having the story being read to the students. And again, not necessarily in English, if that's not what we need. Definitely something worth checking out. So we did read. We did listen. Now let's look at play. Play, these are games. These are computer-based video games, but they're really targeted at reading skills. And I know you and I are in agreement when we say we'd love for the students to be playing games that are vetted, that we know are going to have a stronger impact on their reading skills. Here it is. So this one's set up a little bit differently. Same with ages, no problem there. But instead of genres, we have different literacy skills, okay? 
So I'll just show you what one would look like. So you can kind of get a sense of the gaming like features that are on here. I will tell you that the games are pretty intuitive. I don't find a lot of students need someone to sit right next to them to engage with the activities. They're pretty much able to do it on their own, no matter the age. Um, if we have an older sibling or a classmate that's sitting there, that's great as well. But I'm finding students are really able to navigate this kid zone on their own pretty independently. So let me show you a favorite of ours in our home was always Princess Pesto when my kids were growing up. So I'll show you this game. Give it a chance to load here. As soon as she starts talking, we'll play our game. I can show you what it's like. I think we're gonna choose lowercase letters to practice today. Choose uppercase. There we go. With my spectacular spelling wand, we can make a fish appear. Wands up, spell with me. Which letter makes the sound so my students have to go and collect and find the letter that represents that sound. F. Magnificent. Now, what letter makes the sound I? I. Excellent. Now, which two letters make the sound sh, s, and h? Magnificent. F, I, s, h. Fish. Presto! Spectacular spelling. We made a fish appear. Cue the sparkles, cue the music. Our spectacular spelling play begins. Click to make things move. So now the students, after they've gone through and they've matched the symbol, the letter and the sound, and they built the word fish in this case, they can go and kind of play around a little bit. So they, things move and they I can just move love things to dance. Just to kind of have a little bit of fun with the activity. Okay. So I'm gonna close out of that guy. So that's just one way in which you can think about these games. There's lots of different games, very familiar characters for our students. So families and caregivers can feel comfortable and confident having their child on these games because they know these characters, right? Lots of different opportunities for different games, different activities, different levels of play. So that is KidZone. I told you it's one of my favorite parts of the National Center on Improving Literacy. That's one site I wanted to share with you today. Let me jump over to the next site I want to share with you, which is called Lead for Literacy. This is really built for our practitioners, for us to be able to share information again, with colleagues or with families and caregivers. I'm going to highlight some of the resources that are available here. More for you to explore on your own, but I'll just highlight some of the key features that I think are just so valuable for us. Right away, I'm jumping to this Lead for Literacy framework. So we get so many questions, and you're asking them yourselves, and we're talking about them here around different elements within a reading classroom. So for example, I'm going to click Instruction and Intervention. What this does is this takes me to a variety of resources that have been vetted and pulled together. So I don't have to go searching for all this information. Lead for Literacy as an organization, as a site, they've collected the information and I can easily access it here. So for example, I think of instructional time. How do I use my ELA block to the highest impact? What do I do? Well, here's some information about instructional time. And then here's some articles that are, um, again, vetted, meaning they've, they've been considered and we know they're of high quality around how to best use that reading block. So lots of times we get questions of what do I do with that 90 minute reading block? Well, here, if you click this, it's going to take you to an article that explains why you have to, you know, why it's best practice to have 90 to 120 minutes. How might that look? What are some of the blocks throughout that bigger chunk of time? And it really kind of offers you a guide of how to schedule and set up your ELA block. Rather than you going and searching the internet or searching some textbooks for these answers, come to Lead for Literacy. They've already found those answers for you. All right. Let me show you another uh, piece here. Up top, you'll see these literacy leadership briefs. These are quick one-page infographics that just help us to answer those big questions we have, help us to communicate and get ideas across. So for example, think about, um, you know, what's the difference in a multi-tiered system of support What's the difference between a tier one, a tier two, and a tier three? 
Well, Lead for Literacy has put together this great infographic that talks about the difference and then shows us the difference in a PDF format. So you can download it, share it with your colleagues, print it out, put it up somewhere in your classroom so that you remember. But it gives us not only the verbiage, so like the explanation of the difference, but it really lays it out in this very easy um, infographic for us to see. So definitely take a look at these literacy briefs. So much information there for you to explore and maybe consider thinking about something that you, you haven't thought about before, right? So this would be a great opportunity to do that. All right, videos and webinars. Another great opportunity for you to do some self-learning or some peer learning. These are sessions that have been recorded that are very specific to topics around literacy. So I'll share just one with you so you can kind of get a sense of what we're talking about. Here I think about, you know, what elementary school administrators need to know. So if I were to click this, we get a little synopsis about what the session is going to be about. We can watch the session. There's slides here so that we can kind of follow along with the content. And then it provides you some other videos that are similar in content that kind of may lead you down another path of doing some research on your own. So really valuable when you think about what Lead for Literacy has put together. I'll show you one more resource on this site, and that's the resource repository. Here you have the option of, you can certainly go through and scroll through all of what's available. You can put in a search topic that perhaps you're interested in. You can see I've already looked up some MTSS topics and some secondary literacy. You could also say, well, I'm looking at assessments and I want it to be an article um, and I want to find that. So you can click, I want to have a video um, that's about standards, priorities, and goals. You can click and decide how it is you want to find the document or the resource, the tool that you're looking for. So either do kind of a, a big search, kind of going down a rabbit hole, or you can you know type in something you're interested in hearing about, learning about, thinking through, or find your topic by kind of clicking through and thinking about um, what specifically you want to be looking into. All right, so two valuable resources, the National Center on Improving Literacy and Lead for Literacy. I would highly recommend that you kind of take some time to explore these two sites and start to bookmark them and use them as your go-to resources for you, your colleagues, your families and caregivers, and then certainly use that kid zone for your students, whether they're in the classroom with you or they're at home, they're at a caregiver um, location or at a childcare provider, definitely start to talk to the families, caregivers, and community members about that site as well. Thanks for joining me. I hope that you find National Center on Improving Literacy and Lead for Literacy as helpful as I do, and I look forward to talking to you again. All my best. Take care.